good. Uh, we are happy to have you online, connected, and following our live stream on Facebook. Today is an important day for the Foundation of European Progressive Studies, as well as for our partners, because after almost uh, uh, two years of research, we are publishing an, inter an interesting and relevant report on inequality in the top 10% uh, in Europe. Uh, FEPS has done that with the help uh, and the leadership of TASC, the Think Tank for Action on Social Change that is based in Dublin, Compass uh, from the UK, the Fondación Alternativas from Spain, and Arena IDE from Sweden. Uh, in a couple of minutes, uh, the conference will be starting. Uh, you might have seen the program online on the website of the foundations. And um, you can now check online the study, the report that was uh, under embargo up to this uh, very morning. We have some kind of nice uh, results. Uh, that you will be able to uh, listen in details in the online conference that is about to start, one minute to go. Among the top results, we find that uh, the top income earners in Europe and mostly in the four countries that we survey, uh, the UK, Ireland, uh, Spain and Sweden, actually don't think that they are affluent or rich. They don't see themselves as the better of, though they are the top 10% of income earners. Uh, and uh, it is uh, increasingly clear that they are uh, not uh, close uh, to the top 1%, that is uh, um, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, is going, is going uh, Farther away from the rest of the population, so they feel uh, they feel detached from these uh, extremely affluent people. Um, it is important to see that uh, uh, though most of the top ten percent uh, they do still believe in the meritocratic narrative uh, that explains uh, inequality, so they do believe they do tend, tend to believe that uh, working hard uh, pays. Uh, they are usually also supportive of uh, redistribution tools, though, of course, they would like uh, taxation not to be uh, on them, but on those that are uh, earning even more than, than, uh, than they are. They believe in uh, public education and, uh, and public, uh, and, uh, public uh, health. It is now uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, I see President Maria Joao Rodriguez, President of uh, the Foundation for European Progressive Studies. Uh, she is also the chair of the Party of European Socialist Network on Economics uh, and, and Finance. Uh, President Maria Joao Rodriguez, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, good morning, all of you. This is a great pleasure to join you for this uh, very interesting webinar. And the topic which will be under the discussion is also extremely interesting. Well, of course, we know that social inequalities are a central concern for us uh, progressives. Uh, but uh, in this uh, report, in this research, in the webinar today, we are focusing on a very particular group, which is the top 10%. And uh, let me start by saying the top 10% are very different from the top 1%. Uh, because we know, according to available evidence, that uh, we have, in fact, underlying trends of concentration of uh, uh, wealth uh, on the top uh, 1%. They are, in fact, the, the ones extremely rich. If we enlarge the scope for the 10%, we are dealing with a, another particular group uh, which uh, has uh, very particular features uh, because in fact, uh, this is a group uh, which is characterized by a high level uh, in average of education, 
of Afros. Um, we can say that uh, this is a group quite well uh, protected against the risks of um, populism. Um, they have a sense of um, social uh, distinction. In fact, this is uh, based on an approach where meritocracy plays a central role. Um, there is, uh, in fact, a very famous um, French author already passed away, but uh, work a lot on these effects on the cultural uh, dimension, which is uh, Pierre Bourdieu, uh, elaborating exactly the different um, um, methods, dimensions to elaborate the social distinction. So they have a clear sense of social distinction. Even, of course, um, there are also important differences when we, we compare member states. And the four national cases which were compared also show quite striking differences. Now, uh, a second issue which, which is important for us is about the political behavior of this uh, special group. We need to know more about them in sociological terms, but of of course, we are interested to know also about uh, their possible political behavior. Why? Uh, because um, they remain influential as opinion makers, sometimes uh, as being active in the political life. Uh, the studies showing that most of them prefer to, to be distant from the political life. Uh, but uh, many politicians are also recruiting from there. And I would argue, based on my own uh, political experience, that uh, they can go to different directions. They can remain conservatives. They can be uh, attracted by the, the green uh, narrative and discourse, but they can also come to the progressive camp. And this is one of the issues which should be discussed today, I believe. It's interesting for us to know how can we attract this kind of group for the progressive camp, taking into account their influence in the public debate and the, the public life. Well, the report shows that uh, to start with, the group is sensitive to the certain kinds of um, inequalities, gender inequality, uh, racial discrimination. So the, these are certainly uh, features we should consider progressive ones. Mm -hmm. And this is something we can build on. Uh, nevertheless, uh, for us, it's also very important to see how far can they go to understand uh, the problems of social inequalities at large, which are the angles uh, we can work uh, to um, make these kind of arguments for this particular group. Well, again, the report comes with some ideas, very interesting. Um, one is, of course, the intergenerational trajectory because they are naturally very sensitive to what can happen to their children. And we can argue that uh, the previous um, perception of the future, assuming that children would always live better than the parents, this is gone. Mm -hmm. And so the level of uncertainty now is much uh, higher. Therefore, an angle we can take is to um, question uh, this group about what do you think will happen to your children? What can you do to make sure they will live uh, well? Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is a very interesting angle. Um, the second one is, of course, the impact of the recent crisis, uh, because again, uh, they could understand they are also vulnerable to crisis. They were vulnerable during the financial crisis. They are now naturally vulnerable to the COVID crisis, even if 
this is also very clear that the COVID crisis has a very different impact according to the social group. This is something we perhaps we intend to research, um, to put in our research priorities because this is a very central problem right now. So I hope that so the debate today is um, rich about this. So building on the evidence provided by the report about what are the features of this social group, how can we uh, bring them to a more progressive perception of reality and of their own choices? So I'm leaving the question. Uh, I don't have the, 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 the answer, but uh, I, I count on you to come up with the answers. And look, uh, I'm concluding by saying, I think this is great to use uh, this report as an opportunity to um, promote the, the multi-partisan, the plural debate in the progressive camp, which is now the case in this webinar, with the uh, representatives of uh, Sinn Féin, Labour and so Socialist Party. This is the kind of debate we FAPS, we really want to promote. Uh, so many thanks for all of you, uh, the speakers, and of course uh, to Professor Darling, special gratitude uh, because your expertise on uh, the atlas of uh, humankind is so interesting for us, so appealing, and uh, we will go on working together for sure. So thank you very much, um, and now it's up to you. Uh, thank you very much for, for that, and uh, particularly for your question about how do we attract people from this best of 10% of group to progressive politics, uh, because I think that's, that's key. Uh, I'm only going to talk for uh, less than 15 minutes. I have three points to make, uh, but before I make my, my points, I want to explain how I often try to introduce this issue of the best of 10% uh, and inequality uh, to people when I'm speaking publicly, because it is not an easy thing to grasp and it is not an easy thing for the best of 10% uh, to grasp, who we think we're very numerate, we think we're very able, but an example is useful. Uh, when I went to school, there were 33 children in my class. I was one of the 33 children. So think about a class of children at school, and there are 33 of you. And imagine those children are allowed to spend a little bit of money every week on toys or sweets or something. And the total amount of money for those 33 children is 100 euros. But if you live in my country today, and inequality is high in many countries in Europe, then amongst those 33 children, 90%, about 30, will be getting 60 euros between them, two euros each for 90%. Three children in that classroom will be getting the other 40. So the question is, why do those three children not realize that their material income, their position is so much different when they have 40 euros every week to share amongst themselves and the other 90% only have two. And the answer, at least in this is figures for the UK, is that those three children in the 10% don't share that equally. One child has five euros a week, two and a half times the average child, but they think they only have five because the other child in those three um, has 10 euros a week, twice as much. But that child doesn't think that they're doing well because the third child gets 25 euros every week to spend on toys and on sweets. And then I ask people, if I'm speaking publicly, to think about how those children might behave, how they might mix, whether they would hide the fact they have this money. And then what happens when they grow up, what they do. But that is our, that is our society. Three children sharing 40 euros, five, 10, 25, 30 children just having two euros each. It doesn't work. 
it's hard to maintain friendships. It's hard to understand each other. What happens is that you separate. And you tell yourself, even if you're in the top group, you are badly off. And of course, the child with 25 euros a week, well, they're not in the 1%. Some children have yachts. They have private jets and so on. Uh, my three points. The first point is that inequality is a problem even in the most equitable parts of Europe. Uh, the most equitable part famously are the Nordic countries. Last week on the 15th of September, uh, a new report was produced by the um, Kaleva Sorsas uh, Foundation, a social democratic think tank in Finland, uh, to raise the issue of inequality again in Finland and what was happening. So even in the most equitable countries in Europe, which are the most equitable countries in the world, and include the most equitable places there have almost ever been, Inequality is still a key issue. In Finland, you see it in terms of who gets to go to university and who doesn't. Now, we should celebrate the successes of equality. And again, for Finland, one year, the lowest infant mortality rate the world has ever known in the most equal country uh, in Europe. Uh, you know, it's, it's incredible. You can't do better than not having infants dying. Um, but still, inequality there is a problem. And the way in which you control inequality is by always seeing it as a problem and reporting on it. One of the problems for the more unequal countries in Europe is that inequality is often not looked at as much, not talked about as an issue as much. So that's my first point. Even in the most equitable parts of Europe, inequality is still a key problem. My second point is that in the most unequal countries in Europe, it is the decisive and all important factor. In fact, more important than the pandemic. Uh, inequality has led to more deaths over recent years in the most unequal countries of Europe uh, than the pandemic has. Just spread over two or three years rather than six months. But in those more unequal countries, it isn't noticed. It's just seen as normal. Of course, poorer people die earlier. Of course, life expectancy doesn't go up very much. Of course, it's very hard to get a house. Your children cannot get one. Your grandchildren cannot get one. And it's blamed on the immigrants, not on the fact that you actually have more flats and houses than ever before, but you're sharing them out badly because of income and wealth inequality. People talk about lack of access to health care without realising that in a more unequal country, you spend less on health care because a proportion of the top 10% try to separate themselves away because when they were children at school, they got more money than other children and they think they're special and they think they should be treated first for illnesses other than other people. The end result is that the entire health of your population suffers. And in fact, the mental health of the top 10% in unequal countries is particularly bad, partly because they're so afraid of falling down because they are a little bit aware of how far down uh, the fall is to go. If you can explain to people in the top 10% that in a more equitable future, they themselves will be happier, will be calmer, will be less frightened. But in particular, their children will be safer and their grandchildren. And if that does not work, ask them to think about their future grandchildren. If they don't have children, their nephews and nieces, it doesn't matter if they have children ask them to think selfishly only about their own family and the generations to come and think about the weakest child think about the unlucky child think about the one for whom the exams do not go well and you're a grandparent in future in 2040 2050 2060 even and you're getting older and you're part of the top 10 percent but you see that child not doing well not getting a good job and in the unequal society that you've helped keep unequal because you and many people in the top 10 percent are taught and think that inequality is good it rewards labels and stupid thing because you've helped society to stay or be unequal then your unlucky descendant is the one who's going to end up living in poverty the one who may end up sleeping on the streets the one who will not be treated and you can tap into this selfishness, even of the top 10% and explain to them 
that they will be better off when things are better shared. They will be better off if they're a lucky person, if something goes wrong for them. But if nothing goes wrong for them, they will know somebody who is. They will not have to worry so much about crime or robbery around them. They will not have to walk past people who are starving because their society is well worked out. They won't have to try desperately to stop their children doing most jobs because they cannot be a nurse or a teacher because in their society a nurse or a teacher is not paid enough. They won't have to teach their children to be greedy because it's a dog eat dog society. So the worst problems of inequality are in the most unequal countries in Europe and the greatest gains to be had from even relatively small increases are to be found there. I just go back to my children again. What would it feel like for those three children who are getting 25 euros a day, 10 euros a day or five years a day to be getting 20, eight, four or three? And that's spare money. It increases the income of the other 90% by 50% with almost nothing lost. But it feels like an enormous amount lost because in an equal society, every last year it matters, particularly to those who have the most to begin with. Uh, my third and final point, and, and I'll, I'll be handing over in a minute from this one. Um, greater equality makes your society more robust in many, many ways. We can see an association between greater equality and better planning, better planning of cities better planning of public transport, better planning of railways, better planning of cycle routes through town so the population can be healthier. We see a relationship between more equality and thinking more carefully about education rather than allowing there to be a dog-eat-dog -dog competition of education where you only get a new school if parents decide they will lobby and argue for it, where your universities have to fight each other and lie and put websites up saying how wonderful they all are will be snobbish um, because they want to get the best of international talent and sell their souls for money at which point they stop being educational institutions and start becoming businesses more equal societies are more robust than that their institutions are stronger they're more stable they don't leap from one position to another. They don't face imminent bankruptcy when something unusual occurs. They look after their populations. They have social insurance systems so that when there is an economic crash, people are carried through. And I'll end, and people will say this far too often, but we will see when the final studies are done of this particular pandemic, in two or five or 10 years time, because it is still working its way through and we do not know when it's ended. When the final studies are done of who was most affected, how many people became ill, how many died, how many people became ill from other causes, how many people died of things not related to the pandemic, but because their society was so fragile, because it was so unequal, that when a shock like this came, it couldn't cope and people became selfish and didn't look after each other. In contrast to those parts of Europe that are more equal, more equitable, where people will still argue about the differences in policy and how they dealt with the pandemic, but where they all did better at dealing with the unexpected. And ultimately what you want your government to be doing is you caring for each other, but also preparing for that thing that you don't have to worry about personally because it doesn't make sense for you to worry about the unexpected but it does make sense for your government to do that and the government needs to bring people together and to make their situation safer and more stable before those things occur the longer term one will be climate change and the more equitable countries of Europe, it was interesting what you said about Greens and the top 10%, they're kind of happier to go to Greens because they don't have to worry about their greed. 
in a way about the planet. But those countries of Europe which are doing best in terms of climate change and reducing their emissions and not wasting things are the most equal countries and those countries with the highest carbon footprints and the worst behaviour, the heating up the planet, are the most unequal. You have to say it and say it and say it again. Uh, this report is brilliant, loads of policy recommendations, different recommendations to different countries, really carefully done. And what I'll end on, because I'm a nerd, uh, the statistics in the report are absolutely brilliant. It is hard work working out uh, these statistics and making sure they're comparable between countries. I've never seen a piece of work that's done it as well as this. Thank you for putting up with my 15 minutes. I hope you remember the classroom of 33 children, uh, 40 euros for three children, 60 for the other 30 children. And I hope you have a good day. Goodbye. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? One second. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Danny, Professor Danny Dorling, for a great presentation uh, on, uh, yeah, and for your kind words on this report. I was uh, very fortunate enough and lucky to be able to um, uh, coordinate it. And uh, now I'm going to present some of the main findings and some of the main um, uh, so, some of the main um, points that this report raises, in particular in relation to uh, to the worries. Uh, that's why I we decided to uh, entitle this particular presentation "The Worried Well Off?" Question mark. Okay, and I'll start with a quote. Um, this is from Siobhan, who's a company director uh, from Ireland. She said, I make 100,000 euros a year. At the end of the third week of every month, I have nothing left. I pay for my own house. I pay for my parents' mortgage. I have three kids, two stepkids, one of which is in university. And at the end of the month, there is nothing left. So while people might look and say, wow, you're on a great salary. Yes, I am on a good salary but I'm exactly the same as everybody else. I have nothing left at the end of the third week of the month. Uh, I don't know about you, but for me at least, I, find, uh, I feel a certain sense of ambiguity in relation to this quote, because on the one hand, 100,000 euros a year is a very good salary, uh, even though it, uh, in Ireland especially, I mean, in all, in all countries, really, in, I, don't think, I can't think of any country with 100,000 euros a year isn't a good salary, really. Uh, uh, so one... Um, I guess instinct one has is to say, wow, what's going on? At the same time, when you read the expenses that she has to incur in, it completely makes sense that she runs out of money at the end of the, uh, the, end of the month. So uh, in terms of background for this report, uh, this ambiguity is precisely what, uh, in a sense, inspired us to look a bit deeper into this population. Uh, and previous studies, which are mostly based on the United States, say that the top 10 of income earners have two specific uh, characteristics in relation to public policy. First of all, the preferences are more likely to coincide with actual policy through whatever mechanism. Partly, I guess, because the top 10% tends to dominate the public conversation and the public discourse um, to a great degree. And the second one, uh, which is quite important, is that even though they tend on, in aggregate to be more liberal in issues such as uh, race, uh, gender equality, etc they are less likely to support redistribution, okay? In this context, this report asks, what does this top 10% look like in these in four European countries? What are their worries, particularly economic worries, if there are any? And what are their views on economic inequality, okay? In the context of Europe. Uh, in terms of the methodology, um, I won't uh, spend too much time in this, but the report took two years to write uh, its focus is on income, crucially, because you might be aware that after the very, the very good and groundbreaking uh, work of Thomas Piketty, there's been a, a growing emphasis on wealth. Uh, we, in a sense, want to complement that by actually looking at the top 10% of income and seeing what are their worries precisely. Okay. Um, and it's based on survey analysis, particularly from EU Silk, 
the European Social Survey and national sources. We use mostly the first two surveys because they are uh, quite comparable. Uh, so they're comparable across Europe. And we use semi-structured interviews as well. We have a sample of uh, a bit under 30 per country uh, based on occupation, gender, age, and income. And uh, crucially, we did not tell respondents that they qualified to the top 10% before recruiting, which had its own, uh, which uh, was a bit of a challenge at some stages. And I forgot to say that um, in terms of why we focused on these four countries, I think that there's several interesting aspects to each that would allow for interesting comparisons with notwithstanding that we could obviously look into a more detail into other countries in particular ireland for example uh has uh, its economy is highly dependent on foreign direct investment is uh in our sample of four countries the country with the highest noble incomes however uh, as you will see later is actually one of the countries where the top 10 percent also declares to face more difficulties to make ends meet where the, probably the cost of living is higher. Uh, Spain is also quite interesting because it's a country that was uh, highly affected by the crisis. Uh, it's also a country that crucially uh, has some level of tax competition at the level of the uh, Comunidades Autónomas of the, of the regions, and also has uh, crucial issues in relation to structural unemployment. Um, Sweden is also a very interesting case to contrast to the others, particularly because, uh, as you must be aware, Sweden is one of the countries which historically has had one of the most robust uh, welfare provision, uh, also a very robust taxation. However, um, in the last uh, decades, Sweden has seen its inequality rise to um, a worrying degree. Um, and finally, the UK. Uh, I don't think I need to tell you much about the many challenges that the UK is facing, but uh, I, I would argue, and I imagine Professor Dolling would also agree that uh, inequality has, uh, in a sense, uh, been one of the main underlying factors behind the many uh, political crises that the UK has been facing in the last decade, at least. Okay, now, first of all, a big part of the report de debated over how to define the top 10% in the first place. Here we have a definition which is individual income based on all sources. And uh, we highlight here two um, rows which I would uh, want you to focus on. The first one is the top 10% threshold for each of the countries. Okay, so uh, almost 60,000 in Ireland. Uh, that's for the whole of the population. There's a bit more, it's a bit more if you consider just the workforce. Uh, 36,000 for Spain. 57,000 euros for Sweden and the UK with uh, 54,000 pounds. Uh, now the second bit that I would like you to focus on, which is based on the top 1% threshold, which you can see there as well, is what we call the 99-90 ratio. So the 90-50 ratio is quite common in, the, in uh, studies of inequality, basically comparing the bottom of the top 10% with the median income. And uh, we sort of invented the 99.90, which compares the 1% to the 90%. And you will see that in some countries, particularly, for example, uh, the UK uh, and Sweden, surprisingly, uh, the 99.90 ratio is even greater than the 90.50 ratio. That is, and uh, that's probably one of the key messages of this report, is that the top 1% are breaking apart. Okay, now uh, we have graphs for each of these points in the report, but here I'm just going to mention the main points, uh, some of the main findings. A lot of them are not particularly surprising um, that the top 10%, for instance, is mostly populated by professionals and managers. They tend to be highly educated, especially compared to the rest of the population. These are the sharpest difference to compare to the 90%. Also, the higher up you go, the fewer women you will find, uh, especially in the top 1%, in most countries, it harvests around 20% of the top 1% income earners are women, uh, and about a third of the top 10%. Uh, they are also more likely to have a mortgage and to spend more on housing. Uh, their income is more uh, pro-cyclical. So after the economic crisis, although it had a dip, it grew, it grew faster afterwards. Their share of total capital income has grown, and this is crucial, uh, especially the top 1%. And they are less likely to agree with the rest, with, uh, to agree with the statement government should reduce differences in income levels. So they're less likely to 
uh, compared to the other 90% to agree with the statement, which chimes with previous research. Okay, however, and here I would like you to focus, uh, especially in Ireland, uh, when you ask them uh, in surveys for their reported difficulty to make ends meet, the top 10% you'll see in those bars, I know there's a lot there, it's in dark blue. You'll see that even in Ireland, uh, a big, a significant part, uh, just under 25% of the top 10% declare to face some difficulties to make ends meet. Uh, and in total, it's about 28% if you add the two other categories. Okay, uh, that means that um, even though, as you would expect, fewer people in the top 10% face difficulties compared to the rest, there still is an important number of them who do. Okay, and that might uh, contribute to this, to the fact that they do not think of themselves as rich. Uh, There's an interesting quote from Erica, a doctor from Sweden. Of course, I know that I earn a good salary. I know the salary I have, but I already think about it. And I spend quite a lot of time with people who are not among the top 10%, except my colleagues, of course. Of course, I know I belong there, but I don't think about it. If I probably wouldn't think of myself as one of them one of them, okay? That is also linked to a mostly individualist view of inequality, uh, even though there's a growing awareness according to survey data since 2008, uh, growing awareness of this inequality. So for example, Roy, uh, these, are all, um, uh, th these are all pseudonyms by the way, a finance director from the UK said, I don't think much about inequality in the UK because even the very poor have a bit with welfare. I don't think they are poor enough for me to feel sorry for them. Uh, another uh, interesting quote from Clara from Spain said, I think disadvantaged people have to be careful if they are not able to care for themselves. But I also think all cases should be investigated. What I see, at least in Spain, so there are many people who are able to work or develop professionally, but who don't want to do it and prefer living on subsidies and aid. So the uh, sort of 1980s uh, sort of neoliberal discourse on uh, the deserving and undeserving poor, we found uh, to be still quite relevant for a, at least uh, a big part of this population. Uh, they're also, they're growingly conscious of austerity and of poverty, but mostly at theoretical level. When we asked about the uh, practical effects of inequality, a, a lot of them gave us examples such as, um, uh, such as collections for uh, food banks and supermarkets or homeless people in the street. Uh, here's an interesting quote from a ship captain, Javier from Spain. Um, I am in favor of public services, but there should be more investment, especially in healthcare, as investment has fallen a great deal. After the crisis, the public health system worsened considerably. Those of us who can afford private insurance are very lucky because the public health system is in a very bad state. So, <laughs> so in a sense, uh, the, both, um, there's a certain ambiguity here be between its own luck in being able to afford private healthcare at the same time of being aware of the, uh, dwind the dwindling quality in his view of the uh, public health provision. Uh, there's also growing anxieties and insecurities, and this is something that we would like to highlight, um, especially in relation to the next generation. Uh, Susanna, a CFO for a major bank in the UK, for instance, told us, I worry about my kids. I don't know what they're going to do because all the jobs, and I say that from a financial services background, all the end level jobs for a lot of industries have all been moved offshore. So the job that I started and the job that I did when I started my career at this investment bank is now well and truly done in India. Uh, these two similar quotes uh, highlight the issue of the children. So for instance, Amparo, a small business owner from Spain says, I worry that if at any given moment I start doing worse, my children depend on me. I am 53 years old. I know that if I do badly as a business owner, I have to close down. I won't be hired by any company, another company at this stage. Laura, a management consultant from Ireland, said the following, which I found actually a really good summary of uh, many of the feelings that we found in this population. We are in the top 10% bracket, but when we looked it up, we thought this is ridiculous. How are we in the top 10%? If we lose our jobs, we easily revert to being poor. Who will take care of us then? So uh, just to summarize and uh, look at some of the issues that we uh, are facing with this population, that uh, they're facing four challenges, at least, amplified by COVID. The first one is the uh, pervasiveness of the discourses on their equality and competitiveness. In a sense, they believe, them to, they believe that they have played by the rules. They managed to get jobs in uh, highly paid jobs in industries that are highly competitive. 
uh, and they tend to compare themselves to people who are, as Professor Donnie said, right above them. Uh, this is what uh, Rachel Sherman, a US sociologist, called the upward orientation. They orient themselves upwards. So if, for instance, there's people richer than them, their bosses, their faces, et cetera, and uh, there's obviously poorer people as well, they're somewhere in the middle. Or as they're way, way closer to the top, it's just that the very, very top is some absolutely somewhere else. Um, the second one is in relation to cost of living, austerity, and privatization. I don't think I need to develop that much here in, in the context of COVID especially, and in relation to their own uh, fears in relation to both the future and to uh, the fears of losing your jobs, uh, especially since uh, a lot of these population will probably have had their first contact with the welfare state after the eruption of COVID with furlough schemes and, uh, and other measures to, uh, uh, to, tack to tackle the pandemic. Uh, so this is linked to the fear of social, downward social mobility and finally their isolation as well because uh, very often their social lives uh, revolve around their working lives, all the schools of their children. They generally have relatively little uh, connection to their neighborhoods uh, or especially uh, even if they live in mixed income uh, neighborhoods. Um, and, um, and this is uh, again uh, sort of highlighted by the fact that they tend to think of inequality in mostly abstract terms. Uh, so that's the fear that even they might be left behind. Uh, the report, uh, and I, I'll finish with this, uh, focuses on four areas that we would have to look into. Uh, taxation is an interesting one because uh, they feel that in, in terms of income, they're taxed about right generally. Uh, they would like the rich to be taxed more, but they don't consider themselves rich. And they're ambivalent in relation to taxes on wealth, especially inheritance tax, uh, because a lot of them support them as long as it doesn't touch them, which I guess is expectable. Uh, the second one is in relation to public services. I think a lot of them want to see stronger provision of public services, and there's an opportunity for that, especially after COVID, to justify that point from a progressive point of view. The third one is self-perception. Uh, it's very difficult, as Professor Dorling said, to be able to position yourself and know exactly the place where you're at in the income distribution, where you're right under the, under the very top. Um, and the, again, they tend to uh, dominate the public conversation, the ESA journalists, architects, doctors, etc., the main professions. And finally, local communities tackling social distance. Uh, the report has a few recommendations in relation to that. And I would like to finish just with this. Uh, the late uh, David Graeber, who just passed away recently, uh, you, you probably are aware of the term, we are the 99%. And there's a reason he said we are the 99% and not we are the 90%. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Marcus. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to um, introduce our panel now for the um, discussion for the next uh, 15 minutes. Um, today we have, hi, today we have Jed Nash with us, member of the Irish Parliament and spokesperson for the Labour Party on finance, public expenditure and reform. We also have Paul Gavin, Senator in the Irish Senate since 2016 and Sinn Féin spokesman for education and workers' rights, um, also a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and Paul Marie Close, member of the Spanish Congress and chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, he was High Commissioner for the Fight Against Child Poverty uh, between 2018 and 2019, and is also Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Zarasova. So as I said, we now have about um, 15 minutes for each panelist to respond to the results of the study and discuss its implications for future policy. Um, if we follow the order on, uh, on the agenda there, um, that will be with Jed um, starting the discussion, then Paul and finishing with Pal. Um, at about 12, um, we'll take some questions which are coming in from the chat, the Q&A and our Facebook discussion. Um, and those will be answered by our three panelists um, and also Marcus will contribute to that um, discussion. Um, so if I could ask each panelist to turn their, their mic off while the others are speaking and then obviously back on for the Q&A. Um, so yes, if we'd like to start with um, Jed, thank you uh, so much for being with us. 
Just turn your um, mic, mic on. <laughs> just to unmute your mic. Yeah. That's great. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> great. Um, thank you very much, Jerry, and, and thank you, Marcus. And can I say it's it's been a real pleasure um, to work with you all on, on this report. And my apologies that I didn't have the opportunity to hear Danny's contribution. Uh, Jerry, as you know, uh, I was in our Parliament in the Dáil Chamber um, up until half ten, uh, going through a second stage of a very important bill that the Labour Party have initiated, and it seeks to address a very important deficit. Uh, in the Irish worker protection system, where we actually don't have a, a statutory legal right to, to legal sick pay. It's a massive gap that we need to address, and obviously the pandemic has exposed that as a, a very, very real problem. Look, this is a, a really important report, and I, and I hope, Jerry uh, and colleagues, that it gets the attention and the response uh, that it merits. I think it's fair to say we really are at an inflection point in terms of the future direction of our economies and our societies. And, and really, we as progressives and, and socialists and social democrats have to find our voices again because we have lost our voices uh, in recent decades. And really, the truth is, um, societies have never needed um, social democratic interventions uh, more than they do now. And we're being told all the time that COVID-19 has changed everything, but I guess time, time will tell. We've seen the scale of support for business, for workers and, and economies more broadly. Uh, been introduced over the last few months, you know, supports that are really at eye-watering levels, unprecedented state investment that would have been unimaginable um, just a few short months ago. And as Marcus kind of pointed out there earlier on, I mean, for the top 10% of income earners, it may actually have been the first time that they've encountered direct payment from the state and direct enga engagement from the welfare state, in our case in Ireland, uh, a relatively high um, pandemic unemployment payment of €350, Euros, regardless of what your income was. Um, before you lost uh, your job, uh, albeit in some cases temporarily. So I think given that kind of experience, the time I think is ripe now uh, for us to make the case again for social democracy and for the role of the state, because the COVID has the capacity to do really big and really important things. So I think there's space opening up for us there in that regard, and it's up to progressives to make the point that the state isn't just for Christmas or a pandemic, it's for good, we're here to stay, and we have a very important role um, to play. In terms of the study itself, a number of really important things stand out for me, and many of the points, I think Paul would probably agree with this as well, confirm in an evidence-based way what we as practicing politicians uh, already know. But because of means testing in Ireland, for example, for services like access to free healthcare, because we don't have a national health service worth the name, because of the high cost of housing and, and social services that, that most EU citizens take for granted, you know, such as universal childcare. Uh, many of those who are in the top 10% of income earners bracket, they don't have a penny to their name come the end of the month. Uh, and their lives are precarious too. And they experience a kind of level of precariousness and insecurity that their parents told them they would never experience because of their levels of education uh, and their levels of, of experience. And given but their existence, I think, in some ways has as much in common with low and middle income earners uh, as, as sometimes we might not consider. And looking as well at a report yesterday from the Irish Central Bank that was really interesting that looks at the concentration of a massive quantum of wealth in the hands of a very small number of people. I think the top 10% of income earners now are open to be persuaded about the merits of wealth taxes and asset taxes in a way that they may not have been before. Because uh, we can see the massive dangerous concentration of, of, of wealth and assets in the hands of a very small and influential few. And I think they recognize now that that's not good for society, it's not good for our economy, and it's not good in terms of, of security and, and the idea of, of precarity. Um, so I think to address the, the relatively high level of you know, high cost of living in Ireland, we have to address the demand for more high quality and cost effective and accountable public services and make them available really as part of what I might describe as a, a new social contract. And there's a lot of discussion at a high level around you know, what a new social contract could look like, learning from some of the inequalities that have been exposed uh, by, by COVID-19. And we have to persuade them that redistrib redistribution and the state and, and an active state can benefit everybody. That's a massive job we as social democrats and socialists have to do. Uh, it's a big challenge, um, but I think it's a challenge we have to be up for. And this report really helps to assist us as decision makers, uh, particularly in the context of really big decisions we have to take in our own country and elsewhere around budgets over the next few years. 
Thanks so much, Ben. <laughs> that was brilliant. Um, we're now going to go straight on to uh, Paul. Paul Gavin, so pleased that you can be with us today. Um, please, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, it's, it's a fantastic report. Um, among the best that TASC have, have produced, and that's really saying something. Um, it's, it's, the statistics are absolutely crucial, and I think you produced a document uh, that all of us on the left can use. Um, there's a few key takeaways for me from it. Um, the first is just to say that uh, while it highlights inequality uh, in terms of these statistics, I suspect and I believe that uh, if it was based on wealth as well as income, we'd see an even more stark picture, certainly for, for Ireland, uh, and I suspect across the other countries as well. Um, the second point is this, this common refrain that's, that's throughout the report from the four countries, that many of these people don't regard themselves as being rich. And I would venture to say that um, many of them have a point, because if we look at the thresholds, take the threshold there in Ireland for, for 60,000, um, you know, people on 60,000 aren't rich. And I think this highlights the fact that the real gaps uh, to see that are most significant are, are between that 1% uh, and the rest of the the 10 uh, percent that that's really startling in in, in terms of the income certainly um, uh, differences in ireland but i, I think across, across the way as well um, the, the personal interviews are, are fascinating because it does really give a, a wide range of, of, of perceptions and uh, as the reports summary points out there does seem to be you know perhaps a surprising degree of of recognition amongst this 10 percent about the value of public services uh, which is good to hear um, and yes, Roy's quote definitely does stand out. Uh, I don't think they are poor enough for me to feel sorry for them. Uh, I think we've all met Roy um, <laughs> on the doorsteps uh, from time to time. But to be fair, uh, Roy isn't entirely representative uh, of, of, of the very extensive interviews that, uh, that have taken place. Um, I suppose I want to, to try and address one key question uh, that, that, that's, that's been a theme here, which is, is it important to try to persuade these people and at the risk of upsetting anyone, I'm going to say not especially, not especially. I, I think it's important to persuade the other 90%. Uh, there's no question in my mind that some of these people, when you, you see it, particularly with the public servants in, uh, in Sweden and other countries, who are already uh, on the progressive side of politics, and I've no doubt some of these people are as well. But, but, but the key point is that um, I'm sure all of us in this call agree that inequality is fundamentally wrong and has to be changed. Um, and all of us on the left need to make that case because let's be clear, and I'm not being party political about this, all of us on the left have failed to make that case over the last couple of decades. And as Jed has said, I mean, we are at a real inflection point here. Now is the time for those of us who are socialists, social democrats, democratic socialists, however you want to describe yourselves, to really make the case for remaking society. Um, and what this report I think should prompt uh, is, is, a, is a broader degree of, of conversation about policy responses. So one thing that's clear to me is that income tax rises are limited in terms of, uh, in terms of being useful. They're certainly useful for tackling, tackling that 1%, but people on 60 to 65, 70,000, um, many of them frankly um, aren't going to be able to pay an awful lot more tax, that's the truth in terms of income. But, but a wealth tax is key. And one of the things that I always find interesting is, I mean, every year Sinn Féin uh, approaches the Department of Finance in Ireland and they say, look, we want you to cost a wealth tax. And every year the department says, well, we can't do that because we just don't know. We don't know what wealth is out there. Now, there is the case in itself, because what we need to do, what all of us across the left need to do is map the wealth in our respective countries and across Europe. I have no doubt that it is extensive and that's why I see the value in the wealth tax. It's not just for the money we raise, but because it, enable, it would enable us for the first time to really map the wealth that's out there and to highlight the levels of insecurity there. I think, so we, I think we need to, all of us across the left, buy into this idea of wealth taxes and asset taxes. They haven't really been uh, a, a common um, policy thread since the 1970s. Uh, and you know, look, look where we've gone since the 1970s. We've gone fundamentally backwards, as, as uh, one of the earlier speakers said, that, you know, the generation of children coming next are going to be worse off, significantly worse off by the looks of things. 
Um, so we need to look at other taxes. And again, we need to be bold. We need to talk about inheritance tax uh, as a progressive measure. And then the last piece is, and, and it's, it's just referred to in some of, the, some of the aspects of the report, we need to have a real conversation about how we tax corporations. We really do, because that's, that's the real big missing chunk here. We've seen a massive transfer of wealth from working people to corporations. There's lots of reasons for that. Uh, the, the decline in trade union strength, the need for collective bargaining, real collective bargaining rights, the whole economic model that's been practiced by the European Union. Uh, all of these things need to, need, to, need to come into a conversation. But we need on the left to be bold enough and brave enough to talk about um, how we tax corporations in a way to build a decent society. Uh, my last point is to say that in terms of uh, this idea that, that some of the 10% speak about in terms of how they've, only some of them, how they've earned their right to be where they are and, and they've done it by themselves. I, I'd, I'd recommend a, a, an English comedian called Stuart Lee. There's a wonderful two minute piece on YouTube called The Money Is Mine, which just highlights how absurd that, uh, that notion is. Because all of us know that it's where you're born, which class you're born into, uh, that are the key determinants of, of how you end up in society and how much money you end up in society. So uh, a really impressive study, fantastic and, and very useful for all of us on the left. Thank you so much. And let's all work together. Let's build a consensus for a radical reshaping of society, a radical reshaping of taxes uh, and equality. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paul. That's brilliant. And uh, finally, over to you, Paul. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for the opportunity to share this, this debate with such distinguished guests. Uh, when you are the last in line, you, you always wanted to say things that have already been raised. But I will, I will point out um, a few issues that might be have not been raised uh, so extensively, at least. You, uh, you know, I largely agree with the report, uh, with the characterization of inequality that is made in the report, and particularly concerning Spain, when, it, when, when the report singles out the low capacity of, uh, for redistribution that the Spanish state has. So the, 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 the low capacity to uh, somehow uh, reduce inequality through public action, which is uh, one of the issues that might be different in Spain when compared to to, to other uh, countries. So prior, prior to joining politics uh, in, at the government in, in 2018, uh, I was a scholar, as you, you said at the beginning, and I have myself written about the topic and I led a study during the, the Great Recession in Spain about middle classes and the crisis that came to very similar conclusions about uh, the attitudes to, towards inequality, redistribution, and the welfare state among these, these upper middle classes that, that, uh, that the report makes. So in that project, in which I interviewed a broader segment of upper middle classes, probably located between percentiles 70 and 95, uh, these were groups that, that had undergone uh, bad times during the recession. And I found there that the single most remarkable feature of those middle classes was economic security. Economic security despite undergoing these difficult times. Many had lost businesses and good jobs, but were able to make ends meet, were able to collect uh, benefits from the state, could rely on, on the state for support, were able to recover financially. They had, you know, they were empowered by, by, by the educational resources. They were able to rebuild their, their lives. So I think my, my finding overlap with the findings of your study here and probably, um, I would say, invites to extend the debate to a broader group, a group, a group of the 25% richest or even the, the top 30%. Uh, I always thought that if we need the solidarity of the richest with the plight of the most vulnerable 40%, we cannot rely only on the contribution of the richest 1%, nor even the richest 10%. We need a broader group to contribute resources, to contribute their voice to our welfare state and to social investment projects. 
And I also share largely the policy recommendations in the report. But let me put a note of caution that was raised by, by Paul before me concerning the role of social democracy. In seeing that at least a group of 10% of these top percent hold progressive and pro -redistribute, uh, redistributive views, and they don't, do not see themselves as, 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 as rich people, we might be tempted to think that we might enlarge our electoral base within this group, that we might attract them to uh, social democracy. And I think this is largely wrong. On the one side, the political space is already crowded. You have liberals there, you have conservatives there, you have green progressives there. So, and they have been there for a while and they are deeply entrenched in this, in this, in this, uh, in this segment of the population. So the identities are linked to, to, to these groups. So on the other side, we should not forget that these top 10% are largely, and they say it, and they are aware of it, they, they might not see themselves as rich, but they, they see themselves as privileged when compared to other groups. So there, there is this book that you, you probably all know by, by Richard Riggs, this, this, this analyst, this British analyst working for the Brookings Institution in the, the U.S., uh, wrote this book, uh, Dream Holders, and they, there he shows that, you know, this group is able to hold opportunities to, 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 to um, basically offer their children, you know, the opportunity of, of maintaining their the status. They segregate themselves from the poorest segments of the society. We, we can see it right now in Madrid with, with the corona crisis, you know, we have a huge segregation right now and these privileged groups are able to shield themselves from contagion from poorest neighborhoods and you know conservative politicians are supporting policies to shield them these groups from from like poorer poorer uh, neighborhoods so you know i think that social democracy has the ideological duty to struggle against processes that contribute to increase inequality and build a less cohesive society. And some of these processes in which, you know, these, these groups participate are doing this, are harming uh, equality and harming cohesive society. And this does not mean that we should not promote policies which they favor, but in so far as they benefit the society at large. So there are obviously win-win policies where segments of the top 10% uh, of the society might, incline, might be inclined to support progressive causes and by doing so, broaden coalitions of support for these causes. The solidarity impulses might help promote the fight against some forms of poverty that might be perceived as especially unfair or, or undeserving, such as the, as the fight against child poverty or against, uh, you know, poverty among the working groups. And social, social democracy is also committed to non-materialist non demands that many of these, these, these people hold, such as the quest for gender equality and the fight against uh, climate change. We also need a stronger commitment to improve state performance, the, the fight against corruption, and the mishandling of, of public resources. And again, here you see overlaps in the orientation of the social democracy and you know, uh, members of this class. To the extent that we do and share these causes, we, we may, may be able to gain trust of these top 10% groups at the margin but we will never be the majoritarian option there. If, if we, if for, you know, an unexpected reason, we became such a majoritarian uh, option there, we would probably have trade-off effects and lose support among other groups, perhaps leaving space for populist forces 
and the radical uh, right where we traditionally have been strong. So I would, you know, um, not be completely, you know, or I would not be obsessed with the idea that we have to, you know, work hard to attract these, these people. We might uh, want them in broader coalitions, but not necessarily within social democracy. Very interesting, thank you. Thanks so much, Pal. Um, I'm actually going to uh, use my privilege as the um, chair of the panel just to um, ask the panelists um, a question that actually David uh, mentioned in the related podcast with Danny Dorling um, on inequality. Um, uh, David's question was, if these people generally have good values, they're well educated, why don't we see in the four countries a vast majority in favour of distribution? Um, so that's my first uh, First question to the panel. Uh, I have a strict answer mm -hmm. because they don't want to pay more taxes, and and, and you know, they, in fact, in fact, I think the report collects uh, some answers that go al along this line. You know, they think you know the state should be more redistributive, policies should be more redistributive. Uh, they, they support welfare state, but when asked if they, as individuals, should pay more taxes to make the state more redistributive and more progressive, well, then, you know, enthusiasm is no longer uh, that high. Yeah, I don't know if uh, any of the other panelists want to uh, answer that. I just need to put your mics on, Paul and Jed. Put your mics on. Yeah, I'll come in briefly there. Um, yeah. I, I agree with the last speaker, but, but, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's broader than that in that um, so much of the, 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 the centre left effectively gave way to, to accepting neoliberalism and this idea that, that, that tax increases weren't, weren't the way to go. Um, so it's not a surprise. If no one's making the argument for progressive taxation, then uh, it's an awful lot less likely that the general public are going to buy into it uh, as well. But basically, there's also just that fundamental point that people don't like paying taxes. Thank you. And um, Jed, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it goes back to, I mean, Paul made a, a reference earlier on, and I, I think Paul may have kind of in, intimated it as well, that, um, you know, you've got this, this kind of cohort of people who believe that they're self-made, um, that um, they owe little to society. In fact, maybe the Irish experience is a little maybe different, in fact, because there's a huge um, support and acknowledgement of the role of our education system in terms of, of social mobility. Uh, and what we don't have is a huge kind of focus in this country on, on private education. We have you know, an elite who do um, invest, if I can call it that, or spend uh, waste, in my view, resources uh, getting, getting privately educated. But, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting kind of question. I mean, it all goes back to me to say this. I, I think we, we do need to spend time um, persuading, um, maybe not a huge amount of time, um, but convincing and persuading and making the case to the top 10% that universal basic public services need to be paid for. And there's a way of through the kind of wealth and asset taxes that may not necessarily apply to them, but would apply to those who they look up to, the people they will never meet, who are actually... Uh, in this gilded cage, the top 1% or even the top 5%, who they have nothing in common with. Um, you know, we have a lot of talk about this country. A lot of people in this country understand the welfare state to be the Department of Social Protection um, that pays, you know, direct income support payments and so on. The welfare state is broader than that. And we need to have a conversation about what the welfare state in the future will look like uh, and what it will cost to provide decent universal basic public services, the kind of which we don't actually enjoy here in Europe, and we are an outlier in that respect. It is something that's worth paying for, and I think that cohort of people can be convinced of the merits of that, probably because of their generally good experience in terms of the education system uh, that they have um, gone through, um, which is diverse, which is mixed, uh, and it's probably the only time maybe that those individuals will have come into contact uh, with somebody from a lower socioeconomic group. Um, and that, I, I think, is a good thing, obviously, uh, in terms of broadening somebody's life experience and a greater understanding of, um, of, of the makeup of society and the challenges that different cohorts will have. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. I don't know if Marcus wants to come in there. Marcus, take you. Hi, hello. Hi. Uh, yes. Um, so um, I, I agree also with the main points that were being raised in relation to, yeah, how to appeal to the top 10%. Um, I don't really feel confident in relation to the what would be the best political strategy to look into them. But my hunch, nevertheless, and this is probably what the report would focus on, is the growing um, distance between the top, the bottom of the top 10% and the top 1%. So, uh, I mean, there's two issues there. One is uh, whether they will benefit from more welfare provision. And my hunch is that increasingly, yes. And whether that in the long term would change them politically or not, uh, that's, another, <laughs> that, that's another issue. Um, uh, but I agree. I agree with the main points. Uh, I also agree that uh, to a certain degree, for instance, I was thinking because I'm, these days I'm based in the UK, that to some degree in the last election, uh, in, and this applies to most of the other countries and the interviews that we had, for instance, in Spain, we found that the group of Ciudadanos was overrepresented compared to the rest of the population. So the center-right party uh, in the UK was the Lib Dems. Um, and feels to me like uh, they are generally a sort of center-right sensitivities, although obviously this is, an, uh, this is a generalization. And that uh, in the last election in the UK where they had to pick between Brexit and Corbyn, uh, in the end, they ended up picking Brexit. Uh, which was partly, at least, because one of the issues was that Corbyn was basically asking for redistribution. Yeah, thank you. Um, so now we're going to move on um, some questions um, that Elaine at FEPS has kindly put together from the Q&A, the chat and Facebook um, discussions. Um, the first one is from Paul Sweeney. Um, what does a wealth tax look like in practice? Is a family home a demonstration of wealth? I don't know if you want, uh, anybody wants to volunteer, Jed? Um, yes, it absolutely is. Um, and there is some division um, on the left in Ireland about what a wealth tax would look like. Um, the reality is that wealth is held to, 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 to a large degree in, in, in property and assets. And that's certainly the case in this country. We have a very modest, uh, what we call local property tax, um, which is for most working people might end up being two, three hundred euros per year and uh, is um, raised by our local authorities or local councils and is used to provide for basic public services in our municipal uh, areas. Um, so absolutely, we could generate more income from a, an even more progressive local property tax uh, and I think that needs to be reviewed. Uh, our government here in Ireland actually have uh, their political instincts tell them that um, for whatever reason, well, I know what the reason is, uh, that they're going to you know, not review this again till the end of next year. It sort of kicked this can down the road because it's politically unpopular um, and the left is divided on the need for a property tax. But it also uh, means as well ensuring that we can generate the kind of um, tax you know, resources that we need to fund our public services from um, capital gains tax, capital assets ta acquisitions taxes, uh, ending some bizarre reliefs for um, some uh, entrepreneurs that is a waste of money and actually some of those reliefs are concentrated in the hands of a very small number of people and are actually th th those reliefs actually aren't put to productive use in terms of gainful employment and, and so on. Uh, and it's also worthwhile as well and I, I, I believe in the charge of this in Ireland we spent huge amounts of money taxpayers' money and, you know, borrow, borrowing to fund our deficit, uh, deficit spending on, you know, resourcing our businesses uh, over the last period of time. It's the right thing to do. But uniquely in the European Union, what we don't do is actually attach any conditions to that. Um, so no conditions around collective bargaining, no conditions around um, paying a living wage, no conditions around uh, employment um, regulation and so on and so forth. But look, the idea of wealth taxes and asset taxes, tax, is it, it's a, asset taxes, is a discussion that we need to have. It's more than a discussion we need to have, it's actually something we need action on and we need to be upfront and honest about. Thank you very much. Um, got a question for um, Marcus now. Um, Michael Wells has asked, um, did you ask your interviewees anything about their attitude to universal basic income? Uh, yes, yes we did. Um, so, um, 
at the end of the report, you'll see the interview script for all the interviews. Obviously, it was adapted or translated for the specific country if the main lang if the language was in English. Uh, but at some point, uh, I think in the middle, when we were talking about attitudes, what should be done about inequality, we did ask about universal basic income. Uh, we found the um, the attitudes towards that question mixed. Uh, mo I would say most of them weren't pretty aware of what the universal basic income was. Uh, when we explained it to them, uh, I would say probably two thirds were opposed because of the typical meritocratic reasons, because it's giving people uh, money for nothing. Uh, however, others, uh, especially interestingly enough, those, uh, I remember a few interviewees from the areas of tech, IT and financial services were very much aware of the threat of uh, automation, for example, that see it as ultimately an inevitability. Mm -hmm. um. Thank you. Um, the next one um, is from uh, Lucy Craig. Um, and this I really strongly agree with, and it's something that our recommendations uh, look at, is the um, need to really um, educate this group about the value of the welfare state services to them in their lifetimes over, over the distribution of their life. She says it's important to communicate and disclose what the tax money is used for, for example, education and health, in order to show that it is less costly to organize um, on a whole for all instead of paying for private education and private health, um, that, that good quality and good access should be guaranteed for all. I don't know if anyone uh, who wants to take that one. Yeah, I, I would say that um, social democracy has always benefited from, you know, uh, promoting and, and providing universal services, good quality universal services. And when we provide uh, good quality universal services, we are even able to gain the trust of, you know, middle classes and upper middle classes. And this is probably the key to explain the success of uh, Sweden or the success of Nordic co countries. You know, it cannot always be done, you know, uh, because it means, uh, you know, for, uh, uh, significant uh, high uh, uh, fiscal pressure that sometimes is not politically feasible. And in some countries is not politically feasible at this moment. Uh, um, and uh, we have to make a special effort to persuade people about the importance of, of welfare services when this, or, or, or transfers when these services are, are not universal and, and are not going to benefit everybody. And parts of the population or the citizens might, might have the impressions that they will never get these kind of benefits. At that point, we need to convince them that they might not get these specific, like focused policies, but they they all are all are benefiting through this life cycle of other policies, uh, healthcare, education, higher education, which goes uh, largely to the middle classes or to the upper middle classes, public uh, education at least in in most of the European countries. So. So, you know, the, the middle classes are benefiting from the welfare state, and sometimes the welfare state is even quite regressive, benefiting more the, 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 the more affluent groups than even the, the poorest groups. So this must be said. This, this has to be said all the time. Yeah. Um, we'll go to a question now from Miguel. Um, social democratic governments in Spain introduced dual income tax in 2006 and proposed eliminating the wealth tax in 2011. How can the panelists explain this type of, these types of policies? I would expect both measures being implemented by a right-wing party, but not from the left. This is a reflection of how neoliberalism and neoclassical economics has been embraced by social democratic parties. Uh, Paul wants to do that one. <laughs> Um, well, I largely agree with the idea. In fact, I was not member of the Socialist Party at that time. <laughs> I must say I was just a lecturer in the University of Zaragoza at that time, and I probably opposed the, the idea at that time. You know, uh, social democracy has been uh, 
you know, contaminated by general currents, third way currents that somehow uh, advocated for this kind of policies that were traditionally recipes of other uh, political groups. And, the, and we have paid it at the Electoral College and we should not go that way uh, again. That doesn't mean that we should not be open to evaluate, to reassess our uh, policy approaches and look for new ways of collecting taxes in a fair way or of spending, of spending in a progressive way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now go to uh, another one I think is important. I'm sorry, it's for the UK again, but I think it's a really important question here. Um, for Richard Hickman, how significant is the UK private school system in insulating the top 10%? So if um, Marcus wants to take that one. Uh, sure. Uh, so um, I will try to make it as relevant to other countries as possible. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sure that a lot of it will apply to other countries as well. Uh, the UK, in the UK, um, it's about 7% of children who end up going to private schools, which uh, presumes that it's an even smaller group of people than the top 10%. Uh, and um, uh, in the UK, I mean, it's uh, very, very well known, and there's a lot of research on the formation of networks and elites uh, that these schools um, uh, can, um, yeah, that these schools basically help with. Uh, in particular, we hear more about the top 1% kind of schools, the Eatons, Arrows, etc. Uh, but probably the, a broader uh, coalition, so to speak, of the private schools has a, has a really crucial uh, effect on inequality and is. Uh, and its reproduction. Um, I mean, there's a lot of literature there. I don't even know exactly in which direction to go. I would just say that, and this is common to Ireland and the UK, it's an interesting debate over what happened after the AE levels algorithms fiasco. Uh, in Ireland, uh, I think they were trying to respond. So in the UK, just uh, I'm going to try and very briefly explain the situation. Uh, in the UK, because of COVID and other reasons, they basically tried to predict the grades that students would have and one of the factors that there was the performance of previous years in the school. So obviously, uh, worse performing schools tended to be in poorer neighborhoods. Uh, so in the end, that made that, that created a positive discrimination for children who didn't necessarily perform that well in, high, in schools that perform well in general, yeah. which tend to be wealthier than the opposite. <clears throat> in Ireland, uh, interestingly enough, they took that, um, the, as I was explained to me, um, they took that variable out and that created exactly the opposite kind of backlash, <laughs> right? Of uh, wealthier parents uh, whose children uh, were sort of dis discriminated against. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's worth pondering. I don't know what the, I would def defer to the Irish uh, contingent in this panel over that debate actually, because that's crucial actually. And I think that's exactly where, um, well, we should, fo we should focus a lot of our, uh, a lot of our targeting because I think uh, the issue of social democracy is especially poignant and relevant for this population, which by the by, the by tends to concentrate between the ages of 40 and 60. Mm. So they tend to have growing children in the, in the view of the future and the, probably the political project. We've got about five minutes to go. I don't know if anyone else wants to come in on, on education there in private schools. Yeah. Um, yeah. Paul, Paul, I think I saw first. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, just just on that last point in terms of how the how the leave insert or A level results were, were dealt with differently, I think yeah. in fairness to the Irish government, they they did recognise that going down the same path as Britain would have been a disaster. Uh, yeah. The way they have dealt with it has still left a legacy issue for people, particularly people who did um, their leave insert last year and now want to 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 to, to re reapply to go to college. Uh, and what really should have been done is, is a more ex expansive uh, set of, of places acro across, across key courses to try and keep the points down. I don't think the government responded signif significantly enough there. The other point I want to make in terms of education is the fact that um, uh, the Irish state subsidises private schools uh, to the tune of 91 million a year, which is absolutely shocking uh, that, 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 that that's carrying on. And, and the argument they make is, well, if we didn't subsidise them, some of these schools would close and the pupils would have to go to state schools. Well, actually, I think that would be a good thing 
uh, but, but the, the idea that, that uh, and it refers back to a point that Powell made earlier, which is that middle classes receive plenty of benefits uh, through welfare. Uh, they're just not well advertised, uh, yeah. but, between, but across uh, tax breaks uh, mm -hmm. uh, and a whole host of measures. Uh, and this private education um, subsidy, it's, it's an absolute disgrace. And again, I would hope that's something that all of us on the left could, could agree with uh, in, in terms of manifestos going, going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to, um, I've got a few, a few more minutes. I might try and take one more quick question. Um, I don't know if there's, is there one that you'd like to ask um, Marcus to the panel? Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, so, um, how easy do you think is, um, I guess uh, I'll refer back to the main targeting, the main point of the report. How easy do you think it is that in the long term, which is, because it's not going to happen now. And I think that I was thinking in sort of Brahmshan terms, one part of the way that we tend to think is discourse, obviously, and politics and what is out there. But another one is live experience. And to what degree do you think that if inequality becomes worse and worse and the top 10%, which obviously is a manageable category and it's a statistical fiction, uh, if the top 10% becomes more and more uh, sort of uh, weaker compared to the top 1%, to what degree do you think uh, uh, that a discourse focus on the children in particular and on economic security would not convince them necessarily. I don't think the social democracy there will have to change its discourse really, but it's just would become perhaps more appealing to parts of this group. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who wants to take that? Maybe just one panelist. Yeah. Paul? Yeah, yeah, very briefly. I, I think the key is to, is to appeal to people's common sense because it, there's, there's common sense uh, in so much of what the, the, the left says. It's common sense that investment in public services is good for society. It's common sense that ch choosing not to commodify health means that when we get old, that, that, that there'll be a state to look after us. And I think we need to, to, to put our policies in those terms and then not be afraid to say, and yes, we need to pay for them. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm now going to- um, Very good day. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No. Just, just, just very briefly. Um, I mean, <clears throat> we've been parties of the centre right. Um, we years trying to, you know, convince uh, Irish workers that they're overly taxed. Well, in fact, all of the evidence shows that they're not. Um, and you know, it's interesting some of the feedback um, published in the in the um, report where, you know, in general, people are saying, look, you know, I'd be prepared to, you know, pay maybe a little more tax if I got better public services. Um, and we need to have a conversation about accountable public services, efficiency in public services, and an understanding of actually how people's money uh, is spent as citizens yeah, and as, as, as taxpayers. Because um, you know, they're, they're, and it's, it's wrong. There's this view that some people have that you know their tax euros are going into a, a deep dark hole never to be seen again. That's not the case uh, at all. So you know, we we need to front up on that, and, and we have a responsibility to the left to um, challenge that argument that. There's a massive tax burden, even the language that is used. Tax isn't a burden. Yeah. It's a very important resource to fund the universal public services that we all benefit from by way of, of redistribution. Thank you so much. And I would just urge everyone, I'm a bit biased, but if we could please look at the recommendations of the report, not just the report, because I think we've got some really, really good su suggestions there. So just a plug for that. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to um, Shana Cohen, the director of TASC, um, for some concluding remarks. Yeah. Thanks, Jerry. Um, I'm actually, I'm not going to add too much substantively. I wanted to thank everyone who's been uh, involved in this project. It has been quite a long haul, as um, FEPS is very well aware, <laughs> and the researchers are very well aware. We started off, um, this was the first, one of the first projects I um, signed up for when I started the job in the um, summer of 2017. And so it's fantastic that we are now finishing it in 2020. Um, it's been, uh, it's been, yes, as I said, a long haul. So I just want to thank the researchers. I'd like to name them. And then I, I would offer a suggestion for going forward, because I think at this really critical moment, we need to think about what we can do on a very practical basis, because it's 
not just rhetoric, it's uh, the situation's quite urgent, particularly as you can tell from my accent, I'm an American, I'm also British because I'm a double whammy. Um, being an American, I'm quite concerned about the future of the world because of our election. Anyway, putting that aside, I really wanna thank Marcos who has had the patience of Job in putting this project uh, together, helping it, helping coordinate the research across four um, countries. We've, um, he's done a magnificent job dealing with different research teams and different research studies. Um, thank you, Marcos. He joined the project, uh, I guess, about four or five months after I started the job. I want to thank Jerry because she came in to help us put the whole thing together. It is a massive report for those of you who've seen it. It's about 300 pages, plus we have the policy recommendations. It's by far, I think, the biggest report Task has ever published in terms of length <laughs> and substance. And it's the first study at least task has done in collaboration with other think tanks in Europe, um, not just FEPS, who is our conventional partner. And I, I want to thank FEPS for their support through this whole process, but also um, the other think tanks. We, uh, we collaborated with um, Arena Gruppen in Sweden. They have done a magnificent job. They have done a magnificent job navigating some tricky waters and putting together their chapter and contributing to the report. And to Jose, not Jose, Jesus and Jorge. I don't know why I came up with Jose. Jorge and Jesus in Fundación Alternativas in Madrid. They also um, navigated uh, some tricky waters in putting together the research and they did a great, great job putting together the chapter. And I wanna thank Marcos and Jerry and um, Francis and Neil. I'm not sure Neil's on the line, but Neil Lawson from Compass. He's at the Labor Party Conference. I don't know if that's still, oh, yep, Neil is just, <laughs> just uh, Neil is here. Thanks, Neil. Um, I didn't know if he was still uh, hanging out the, with the Labour Party in the UK. Thank you very much for participating, Neil. You agreed. You were the first person to sign up for this project outside of um, Ireland. And finally, I want to thank, um, I'm not, they're not on, there are several research assistants who helped out with this, um, this project, and I'm going to thank them personally. They're not on the line, but I will go. They helped out to, to conduct the interviews, as well as Marcos, and I conducted some of the interviews. Anyway, thank you very much for, for your help, and thank you for your patience, because it's required quite a lot. Um, going forward, uh, I've heard there are two things for me that um, are striking, and in terms of future projects, and this is something maybe a discussion to have with FEPS in terms of the social democrat agenda. Taxation seems to be the biggest issue. Where do we go from here in terms of taxation? There will be huge deficits, national deficits in their budgets. And I, I'm sure um, the EU is not going to replicate the response they had to the financial crisis in 2008, but it's still important to think about how those deficits will at the, at the, be manageable, but at the same time, they don't re resort to austerity. That and everyone is saying they're not going to resort to austerity, but I think that we need to take we need to hold people to that commitment because now is the time to, to invest in public services. So I think for the social democrats moving forward or whatever you want to call people who are progressive, uh, how what is a fair, transparent tax system and how can we explain to people where the money is going? In Ireland, and that's the case I'm most familiar with, there was no issue about paying taxes. There was none, nobody, nobody amongst the interviewees complained about paying taxes. I mean, I, I, pay, I pay an extraordinary amount of my money. If I were living in the US, I would pay a lot less of my money in uh, taxes. But I, what upsets me is that in the UK, I also paid a lot of taxes and I had the NHS. In Ireland, I don't have the NHS. I have to you know, pay for health services. So I think if you were to take Ireland as an example, um, it would be great to say, I'm really happy to pay that level of taxes, but I, I do want to be able to access primary care for free. So I, I think there's a there's a there's there's something to be said about the agenda of taxation, not just to pay off national deficits at this point, but where can we invest? Where can states invest strategically to make sure people lives are better and that they're more resilient because this could be the first shock of many if you take climate change into account. Um, so we need to prepare the population and that does require investing in health, housing, education, and infrastructure. And so I, I would encourage going forward to think about taxation and transparency about investment. And I, I think there's a really good point to be made about transparency and income distribution because there was so much surprise amongst the interviewees about how their position, um, like even the people who in Ireland who said, oh, I know I'm in that um, bracket, but I just don't feel it. So I, I think there is something to be generating a debate that income actually only goes so far. And that's because of the dependence upon wealth. And that's because the 1% is earning so much more than the rest of us. 
anyway, I will leave it there. But again, I, I do want to thank everyone who's been involved in this project. And I, I really, really, really appreciate um, your patience and your collaboration and your collegiality through this whole thing over the past, let's say, two and a half years. Yeah, I'll leave it there. And I don't know if Peps wants to sign off somehow. Or is that it for us? David, do you want to sign off? Or should I say thank you? for everyone attending. We've had quite a good audience today and I'll thank all the panelists and the speakers. Thank you and I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye, thanks.